<laughs> Alistair Johnson on this episode of Kicked Back. Alistair, thank you so much for joining us. We're so happy to have you. Obviously, you're big in the conversation of everything that's going around in Canadian football. So thanks for joining us. Oh, well, thanks for having me. I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to being here and talking some footy and get to know you guys. Awesome. Liam, what are you up to? Everything's good over here. Al- Alistair, how, was, uh, how are you recovering from the jet lag from coming back from Europe? You know, after talking to the European guys, I have to say they are right. Coming back this way is a lot easier than the opposite. Um, when we first got to Bratislava, Slovakia, a place I couldn't even tell you where it was in a map, um, that first couple of days were tough. Um, but no, getting back here, you know, you just got to stay up as late as you can and then and then you're trying to you're, you can sleep as long as you want it. So it wasn't too bad coming back. So we're all we're all back. We're in gear now. We're ready for the playoffs. Um, whatever throw, whatever else someone throws our way, we're, we're ready for it. Uh, Alistair, your birthday's in a couple of days. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I thank you for knowing that. I don't even know if my own parents know that. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to bring it up on the podcast and frame it just like that. Um, so he can realize that he's on like the creepiest podcast of all time and, and get your, your very genuine reaction. What are you going to do to celebrate your birthday? Um, we're going down to Miami, so uh, that's a good place to be, I think, for a birthday. But uh, hopefully we'll be celebrating the next day with three points, um, you know, going into, you know, the playoffs on a, on a high. And, and, you know, maybe Toronto can really give me a nice birthday present and go steal a point or two from Philadelphia. And if they manage to do that, then we could potentially be walking out of there as Eastern Conference champions. So that would be the ideal birthday situation. But, you know, a couple of things need to happen, and we need Toronto to – to pull their weight, which, you know, I'm, I'm not too confident in, uh, but fair enough. Uh, so we'll see. That's, that's kind of the birthday plan at the moment. So my dad and I are season ticket holders for Toronto FC since day one. Like, we're I'm super sorry. fans. I know. I I know. <laughs> well, there was the one year I was, I was actually working for the yeah. team where they won everything, and that was the most incredible, like, experience from a work perspective and low-key fan. I know I'm never supposed to say that, yeah. but... I, you're not Fair supposed enough. to be doing that job if you're not a fan. Um, so it's uh, it's cool to see you playing for Montreal. And it's a big standing rivalry between, obviously, TFC and Montreal. But hopefully, TFC can pull out a, a good win for you guys. Yeah, that, you know, I'll tell you what, that actually would be the perfect birthday present. They have the talent there. Um, obviously, it's been a difficult season for them. But we're expecting a big bounce back year from them next year. So, you know, we got to get ready for that. Um, but, you know, it's always nice when you finally have a year when, you know, you can look at where they are on the table and where we are. And, and I think it's been a nice solace for our fans to go, ha, ah, at last. Because, you know, Toronto FC fans, they're loud, they're proud. And, and I think we've, uh, we've done pretty well to help our fans have a little bit of, you know, a little bit of swagger in their step this year. I love it. Uh, it. Quick question. Sorry, go ahead, Liam. I was just going to say, how's it been? playing back in Canada after being in Nashville, now you're with Montreal. Like, what's what's kind of the difference, I suppose, in playing very two different markets? Yeah, you know, um, Nashville's an expansion team, so there's a lot of, you know, things kind of going on the fly. There's a lot of excitement around the team just coming in, a new stadium coming in, which I unfortunately left before I got to see. But, uh, no, I, I think coming home and, and playing in Canada – especially this year has been different than before just because of the hype around the world cup as well. Um, you know, I, there's been such a shift and I've seen it with the national team and also seen it with the club versus coming up and playing in Toronto or coming up and playing in Montreal, you know, in previous years versus now there's just such a buzz around the entire nation about, you know, what's going on, uh, with the national teams, uh, both the women and the men's. Um, so it's been really cool to kind of be back in that home market and kind of just experience it. You know, the, just from the media, how involved they've been, wanting to get to know all the players and, and, and the fans. You know, everyone just wants to be a part of this. It, it's such a cool time to be a, a football fan within this country. Um, and, you know, to really kind of be home, to be able to embrace that and feel it has been, has been pretty special. Okay, cool. Talk to us about that, though. So you're, you're 23 right now, right? Yes, correct. 20, 24, 24 two days, isn't it? Yeah, what is it? I'm about to tell you your social insurance number. Yeah, oh birthday. my goodness. How to spell your middle name. <laughs> um, <laughs> interesting, though, because when you were growing up, uh, mm-hmm. 
football wasn't the sport it is now at this moment in time in Canada, in the U.S., in, in North America in general. And the women doing so well, winning gold at the Olympic Games, and then now you guys qualifying for your first ever World Cup in 36 years, it's a different type of tempo. So when you were, when you think back to like a young Alistair Johnston, did you think that you would be in the position you are now, you know, starting out in League One, going into MLS, now representing the Canadian men's national team? Like this is just such a cool picture, maybe for even young players wanting to be kind of in the position you are in in the next 10 years, which I think is completely possible. Yeah, you know, I think that's been the coolest part about what our group has done and that goes hand in hand with what the women's team's done over this past decade is that, you know, when I was growing up, when I went out and played in the backyard every single day after school with my younger brother, I dreamed about playing for England in a World Cup because that seemed more realistic and possible than to be playing for Canada in a World Cup. And, you know, now that we finally made it there, um, we don't want it this to just be a flash in the pan. Obviously, we have 2026, which we know is going to happen. But we don't want it just to be these two World Cups where we're there just to make up numbers. No, we want to go and show that we more than belong and that Canada becomes a mainstay at these major competitions. Um, and, you know, I think that's so important because it'll give that next generation of young boys and girls the opportunity to look up and have role models. You know, you have Christine Sinclair, you're going to have Jesse Fleming. And then on the men's side, you're going to have you know, Alfonso Davies, uh, Jonathan David. And... And now we're so much more in the limelight. We're on TV. There's so many different ways to watch it. You're going to be at a World Cup for crying out loud. You know, it really gives kids the opportunity to dream. And, and also from a different aspect is that you look at all the different pathways guys in our team took. Of course, there's the Alfonso Davies pathway where you get noticed at 14, 15. You're playing MLS um, at that age. And before you know it, you're a multi-million dollar move over to Bayern Munich. But not everyone's pathway is that way. You know, for example, we have so many guys that took the college route. Uh, for example, now Joel Waterman, who even took the Canadian University route. So there's so many different pathways, which I also think give that younger generation hope that, you know what, there's not one way to skin a cat. Um, there's so many different ways that I can make it. And if I just focus on getting better each day and doing what I love, you know, there's a chance that I'll, I'll be able to represent my country at a World Cup, for example. Because for me, I can say it firsthand is that I didn't even think that was possible growing up and now to see it and to understand that we're going to help future generations truly aspire and fully commit to it. I only expecting, you know, better and better players to continuously and, uh, you know, just consistently be produced uh, from, you know, the Canadian market. So that's really exciting because we have really have a chance to, to change this trajectory and, and continue to push it forward onto new heights and new levels where, you know, we're not just, again, a team that every 36 years makes a World Cup, but we want to be a team that's consistently there and competing. And I think we have a chance to do that. So you mentioned that, like, the kind of belief when you were younger of Canada never making it to a mm -hmm. World Cup when you were able to play. Like, when did that belief kind of start happening on this run where you're like, okay, like, now, now we actually have a really good chance of getting to Qatar? Um, I mean, there's a couple moments. Uh being one of the younger players in the group who hadn't had the battle scars of, you know, losing down in Honduras and all these different things, you know, once we qualified for the octagonal and we kind of saw the emotions of some of the older players, you know, we were kind of looking around like, yeah, of course we should have beat Haiti home and away. Like, it, what's what's so crazy about it? Look at, look at our roster. Look at our locker room right now. We're insane. Um <laughs> But at the same time, it kind of put things into perspective like, no, this isn't the norm. This isn't what Canada soccer's done over the past couple of decades. Like normally we would fall in at this hurdle because of some unforeseen circumstance. But, you know, this team is different. This team was special. And I think the moment for me where I really realized like, oh, we have a chance is the Panama game. So pretty actually early in the octagonal, um, we tied a couple of the first games, you know, that we probably should have won. Um, but Panama ball gets just punted down the line and, the center back should deal with it. And us as a back line, we're still kind of in our box. Like, what's what's Fonzie doing? Why is he sprinting? Because you could tell he could smell something was wrong. And he just went into full speed turbo mode, meet me, full road runner, caught the guy in the ball, did one of the most athletic plays I've ever seen, balancing, shielding a guy off, keeping a ball in play. And as soon as he kept that, you should have seen it because the coaching staff's always on our back line. You got to get up. You got to you know, got to compress the field because our athletic players up top are just so crazy fast that if you let that stretch happen, it gets too big. But I'll, I'll be the first one to admit it. I was standing, I think, in my box with my jaw dropped. And it was so cool because as he picked the ball up, you could just see the whole crowd stand up 
And they sense like, oh, this is a big moment. And there's just a roar. And as soon as he got it, you're like, he's going to do something special here. Cuts inside, scores it. And I think our whole back line was still in our own 18, but just jaws on the floor. It was an unbelievable moment. And, and when that happened, I think that really kicked it into another gear where even like, of course, inside our locker room, we always felt that we had the ability to do it. But I think outside all of a sudden there was a belief around Canada, the soccer fans, that this could be the group to do it. And that led perfectly into um, the Edmonton games. And I think that's where we really showed that, yeah, we can we can have a home field advantage. We can conquer calf other teams and, and that we belong. So I think that was really the moment against Panama when Fonzie had that just moment of brilliance that kind of turned it on its head where I think everyone's like, not it wasn't now like, oh, it's it's hopeful. It's like, no, no, we're going to do this. And we, we deserve to do it. You know what? It's uh, we've been saying on our show that we really think, and this isn't just because we're Canadian, but we really think that this mm-hmm. team has the potential to upset teams at the World Cup. Um, yeah. Maybe not from an experience perspective, which you know, you know, as a footballer, know that that's important. But yeah. you guys have such key individual players that work so well together as a team. You speak to that Fonzie moment. There's you yourself. You know, a couple guys who are playing Champions League football right now, Kyle Laren, Tejan Buchanan, yeah. um, you know, just really good, Estacchio, just really good guys that maybe on a global mm-hmm. scale, the media and teams aren't paying attention enough to where you guys can come show this crazy skill set that you have, have moments like that and really upset a team. And I know that the group is tough. That's something that everyone's speaking to, but yeah. I don't think people speak enough to to what you guys have done, how you guys won CONCACAF, how you beat pretty solid teams within CONCACAF. And you're going into a World Cup with, I think, and I don't want to speak for you, so you guys, you, you know, you tell yeah. me, <laughs> with, this, with this determination and this drive where you're like, holy shit, you know, we can do something that's really never been done in the country. That's got to be exciting. Yeah, no, we look at, you know, our group, obviously it's a difficult group. We understand that. We understand that we don't have any World Cup experience compared to some other teams. But at the same time is that we can almost use that, almost that naivety of being a young, inexperienced group in these massive matches to our advantage. You know, you almost don't appreciate the moment enough because you're like, okay, well, this is cool. Like we're out here doing it. Well, other teams like Belgium are potentially feeling that pressure of, you know, being a world cup favorite. Um, you know, we don't have that outside pressure on us, but at the same time is that we do believe in our talent. We know what we have. Our coaching staff is great and we're going to play to our strengths. I'll tell you this as well is that someone who can run a 10 second, hundred meter, that's fast. Like there, we have dudes who like, it doesn't matter what level you're playing at. Speed is speed. And we have some fast dudes, man, like crazy athleticism all around the pitch. And, and we're going to use that to our advantage for sure. And, and I think that of course, there's going to be teams with more experience and more technical ability. And we understand that, but we're going to play our style that forces them to kind of play into our traps. And I think that that's one of the most exciting things for us is that we've been very collaborative with the coaching staff in terms of setting up a game plan that we want to play because we understand this is the biggest stage in the world. People are going to be judging us. And if you go there and you just bunker in, for example, for all three games, maybe pick up one point, is anyone going to really going to remember that as a, as a great time? No, like that's not our identity. That's not how we want to play. That's not how we want to be seen by the world because we don't think that represents our group or our country very well. So that's a big thing for us is that we want to go out there and, and play our style, not, not in a loose fashion where it's reckless, but at the same time where I think the fans are going to be like, we're putting ourselves in a position you know, to win, but at the same time, we're also playing technical, attacking, fast-paced football that everyone can get behind so that you know the neutrals are even going, you know what, fair play, Canada can play. Um, they're an enjoyable team to watch. So we know what our strengths are. We know what our weaknesses are. And, and we're going to find a game plan that works best to that. So how, how much preparation has already gone into what, who you're going to play at the next World Cup? Like, obviously, you just played guitar and you, Uruguay. Like, are you guys, when you go into those games, are you thinking, okay, this is how we want to set up against Belgium and Croatia kind of deal, if that makes sense? You're spot on, actually. Uh, the reason why we picked the games we did is that we wanted to kind of implement a game plan that we thought was going to be similar to something we're going to see against Belgium, for example, with the Qatar game, and then Uruguay, something we're going to see similar to um, the Croatia game. So we had tactics that were set up 
for Qatar, but at the same time is that everything that we were seeing was also with, okay, yeah, he's going to show up here for Qatar, but this is also exactly where De Bruyne's going to show up. And it, it was to see pictures so that we're getting ready because it, it's so difficult in international football. I remember we, when we qualified, um, John was talking, he's like, yeah, I've already looked at the, the calendar. I think we have 16 sessions um, before the World Cup. And I said, the World Cup's eight months away and we only have 16 sessions. He's like, yeah, like w- with how the international windows work, that's how it is. So it's really difficult to, you know, finally tune and prepare for those matches when you just don't have that much time together with the group. So in terms of that, I, I, I mean, the coaching staff is in an absolute rabbit hole every day. They're, they're locked away, working hard. And yeah, so he's already sent me like a 64-page document just on Belgium. It's just heat maps and it's different. Like, honestly, you need like a legend. I need like a separate book of just abbreviations of what each thing means because everything's on like size two font i'm like zooming i'm like i got no clue what's even going on here and i love the game of software and i love seeing the analytics and i'm just like this is so overwhelming um but it's great as well because even when you flip through it you do start to notice things you know start to notice tendencies um and and what you're expecting to see from belgium um and, and from teams like that so it's really cool where there's definitely there's definitely one thing you're not going to be able to knock us on after the World Cup. It's that we weren't the most prepared team because there's just no way that we're not going to be. It, it's unbelievably amount of effort and time that's being put into it. So that 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 goes out to our coaching staff. We're putting in the hours and and the players who are buying in and and want to learn. You know, it's it's so important. You have guys that are really fully committed to that, and we have a group that is. You guys uh, taking on Uruguay was cool because you're you're playing against players like Suarez, Nunes, Valverde, right? Some top names in football. Mm-hmm. Is that something that's exciting for you, knowing that you're going to be sharing the pitch with a Kevin De Bruyne, um, a Luka Modric, and you guys, you know, that that's just to me, I mean, I, I talk about that and I smile because I feel like that's just such an incredible moment that you guys are going to experience. Do you ever sit there and think about that? It's tough not to, to be honest. You can really get carried away with it too. You're like, oh, well, hypothetically, if we were to get out of the group, would we potentially see England or, you know, maybe Argentina and Messi's, maybe his last World Cup. And, you know, it's like, it really puts things into perspective. Like, we're going to be sharing the field and sharing a tournament with Lionel Messi, Cristiano Ronaldo. This is like everyone's childhood heroes growing up on our team. So (laughs) it's, it's really crazy like that. But again, you can't get too carried away with that because before you know it, your head's in the clouds. It's 20 minutes in, you're down 3 0 to Belgium because Kevin O'Brien's got two goals and assists. So you really need to like understand that and understand that, you know, there's going to be some things that are going to happen in the field that you're going to go, that's insane. Like, I didn't even realize that was physically possible. I've never seen that in my life up close. But at the same time, is that it's still 11 v 11. It's the, the pitch is yeah. still the same size. The ball's still round. Um, there's still human that we're aware of. I'm not sure about Holland. He's not the World Cup. So, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. it, it's you know, we, we, we feel good in that aspect. So it, it's it's going to be an unbelievable moment walking out there for the first game, you know, holding each other, singing the national anthem. It's going to be really special. But at the same time, this is exactly that. It's still football. Um, and, you know, we start off with scores nil-nil. And, you know, we're going to have every fighting chance out there. So it's a really just exciting period. Um, but yeah, uh, the thought of sharing the field with a guy like Kevin O'Brien, it's, it's kind of mind blowing when you really think about it. How is this international break different compared to the other ones? Did it feel like more of like a world cup kind of feel? I know obviously once you get there, you'll know what that truly feels like, but you actually had to travel this time. We set off the start, like yeah. a lot of people usually have to travel this way. So how is it different for you? Um, you know, it was different just in the fact that of course the travel there was long, but there was no travel between games. So we're used to in the mm-hmm. CONCACAF, like your first game, whatever, let's say I was in Nashville, but you fly up to Toronto for the first game. Or for example, let's say one of the windows, you fly down to Honduras, play in Honduras, and it's a seven hour flight overnight right after the game up to Toronto, boom, play there. And then right after that game, you're flying down to El Salvador. And then from El Salvador, you fly out. And it's just like, that was the craziest 10 days of my life because I was everywhere. I've been on a plane for what felt like two of those seven days or whatever it was. Uh, and on the field for the other three, it's just like, it, it's mental um, how exhausting it is um, in terms of just the travel, the wear and tear on the body. But that's what was kind of nice about this one is we kind of got to one place, one base camp and, and really could focus on that, um, which I think is going to be massive, uh, especially because this World Cup is very different than other ones in the past with 
the proximity of all the stadiums. You can really have a home base and not have to worry too much about the travel, which I think is definitely something that, that not a lot of people are keying in on. Um, it, it's, it's a lot different if you play in a World Cup in Brazil, for example, and you're playing in Rio de Janeiro versus you know somewhere else. So it, it, it does make a big difference, that travel. Um, and in terms of the games, um, it's, it's a different level of opposition altogether. You know, mm -hmm. you're going up against guys who can punish you for any little mistake. And, and you know, we saw that with Uruguay. Um, I felt it firsthand. I took one wrong step against Nunes. And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm in a lot of trouble right now, I think. And sure enough, I was. Balls in the back of my net. And I said, yeah, as a Man United fan, I, great. I just let a Liverpool striker score on me. Uh, that doesn't feel great. <laughs> um, but, you know, so it, it's cool like that. And, and, and But that's what you want as a professional footballer. You want to test yourself at the highest level. And especially for us guys in the MLS who we're not always, you know, you know we're, we're constantly badgered about it. Oh, it's not the highest level, yada, yada, yada. But, you know, we want to play at that high level. We want to see what it's like. And to go up against a guy like Nunez and, and Suarez is, is special. And, you know, now we're going to get the chance to go up against Lukaku, De Bruyne, Modric, as you were saying. Um, some unbelievable, like, Ballon d'Or-worthy talents. Um, so that's going to be a whole other level entirely. And and I think as a footballer, that just really excites you because it brings out the best in you. You know you have to play at that level or it'll get ugly. Um, so uh, we understand that and we're excited for that challenge. Alistair, at these tournaments, what do you guys do to maintain balance? Because I'm, I'm sure lots of practices, obviously lots of games, yeah. but what do you guys do in your off time to just kind of escape a little bit of that football grind, which is obviously important. What, what do you guys do as a team or even individually? Probably a team meeting. Uh, John yeah, right? loves his meetings. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, but no, no, it's it's a pretty mentally intensive um, couple of days. But no, getting away, everyone's kind of got their, I mean, we're all close to each other, so it's fun. It really depends on the city too. When you're in Bratislava, Slovakia, it's it's a little different than when you're in Vancouver, Toronto, and you're like, okay, yeah, the, the boys are going to go and, you know, we'll go out for dinner or whatever, but uh, no, there's lots of cards. There's lots of, you know, FIFA set up in one of the rooms. Um, um, Scott Kennedy's probably on a treatment table for six of the hours. Like there's lots of things to do, you know, like, uh, so we have a good time there. Um, and we, the bad, that's probably the best part about it is it really is a brotherhood. You know, we really preach that, but everyone enjoys being around each other, catching up, hearing about families, you know, some guys have kids hearing about that and, and just being around each other. Cause that's something you forget is when you're with your club, yeah, everyone's close, but you see them every day. But a lot of times guys are from all over, raised completely differently. This is a group of Canadians who experience a lot of the same things that I experienced. And I've played with some of them growing up. And, you know, we all are, at the end of the day, a lot of us from the GTA, for example. And, you know, if you're from there, you share a lot of similarities. Um, so it's cool to all be together and just kind of relate and, you know, talk our slang, do our thing, um, have some fun together. And, and you know, it's, it's always fun being with my brothers. So... No, that's kind of the best part about it is the off time too, is just being around each other, really enjoying each other's time and, and presence and, uh, and yeah, taking some money playing cards. Who's the best at cards and who's the best at FIFA? <sighs> best at FIFA? This is a great question. It's not me. I'm going to put that out there right now. Like, honestly, I've watched some <laughs> of the guys play. They are so good. Like, I played probably FIFA 14, FIFA 15, and I, I fancied myself as a pretty good player, like maybe a Division One kind of player. <laughs> now, like, honestly, the game, it's completely different. I don't even know what's going on. And I see these guys, like, I, I wouldn't even have a shot. It's just, it's actually kind of heartbreaking. The best are all the guys who are, you know, born 2000 or later. Like, these guys now, I don't know if, if something changed in that generation or, like, they got a different, like, <laughs> controls. But I, I swear, like, you can't even get the ball off of a guy who's born in 2000 or, or later. Like, it, it's really insane. So probably, like, a Fonzie uh, is good. Um I'm trying to think who else. Fonzie, I think, is really good. Um, and then in terms of cards, um, I fancy myself in cards. But there's a couple of guys. It depends on the game. Like, for example, MLS, the big game is 22. Um, it's, a, it's a classic game. If, if you've played mm -hmm. the MLS, you you know this game. It's it's. I think it's in the Rookie Symposium. You learn it pretty much the first day you get in the league. As soon as you get drafted, you know how to play this card game. But poker, uh, other things... Um, some guys are definitely some gamblers. I've seen some crazy money thrown on some tables and I've gone, yep, that I cannot afford to be here. Um, but no, uh, I, I fancy myself as a 22 player. You know, I went to school, got an econ degree. I feel like I'm, I'm not counting cards, but I, I know when the deck's loaded. Uh, I know when to, to go in, go out. So, uh, 
no, I'd say I'm pretty good at 22. But other than that, you know, everyone's pretty solid. Everyone's, we got a we got a good, smart group of players. I'd say. Uh, I wanted to ask you about Hutchinson. So he's obviously one of those guys that's been around for a long time. Like, what's his leadership been like with the team? And like, like you said, with the Honduras thing, and when you guys beat Haiti, like you felt like you should have. And I'm sure yeah. he was one of the guys who was amazed by it. Like. Is it just been kind of an inspiration thing to like help him get over the line and make it to a World Cup as well? Yeah, no, he's our Michael Jordan man. Like he walks in the room and he's silent, but you're just like, whoa, something changed. Like the air just like went still or something. Like he just got like an aura to him. He's got such a presence. Like when he walks in a room, you're like, oh wow, yeah, that's that's Teams. Wow, that's that's the goat. Um, so it's really cool to have him on the team too. And I mean, like for us younger players, of course, it's a massive motivation. Obviously, you want to make it to the World Cup for your country, for yourself, for your family. But to get it over the line for those guys who have just cut their teeth with this program for so long. And, you know, even when they were whatever, 100 and whatever it was in the world, still flying across the country. I mean, across the world from Turkey all the way over here to, you know, come and play, you know, St. Kitts. It, it's, it's really impressive, the dedication, the hours, the time. Uh, the sacrifice he's put in for his country so it's amazing to really know for and also for him to be a massive part of it like he is mm -hmm. he, he's not just here uh, you know as an honorary member no he's here he's playing um he's such a good player too man i've just i've learned so much from him and, and it's also cool he's just such a good guy he's so humble so quiet anyone can talk to him um but i feel like the outside media can sense that too just like if you ever have a conversation with him or hear him talk you're just like man that is a kind soul and that's exactly what Atiba is. He's one of those guys that you just want to see succeed at life. And he's done. he's been successful in every aspect of it. Um, so, no, it, it's great that he's going to be able to, you know, cap off what an illustrious career he's had with the World Cup. And, you know, if he wants to, to hold on and, and fight for 2026, I wouldn't put it past him because um, the octopus, he can do some crazy things. I think he ages backwards, a little Benjamin Button situation. But, <laughs> no, he's a special player, special dude, and, and no one more deserving. That was one of my one of the weirdest movies I've ever seen, Benjamin Button. But a yeah. good one, a good one. If you haven't seen it, really? I highly I, uh, recommend. I, I wouldn't. I would recommend weird. it. I'm not recommending it. I'm just quoting it. It was really weird. <laughs> it, was it was really weird, weird. But I've never seen a movie like that, so that's why I would say watch it. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, I see where you're going with that. It's a good angle. The only way. Okay. Um. Your first phone call after the game that you guys qualified for the World Cup, who was it to and what was that like for you? You know what? Because we were in Toronto, my first phone call was really to Instagram Live because my whole family was there already and we were <laughs> – the champagne was out. We were – oh, we were having a good time in the locker room. Um, honestly, I was probably too – incoherent to remember exactly who my first phone call was but no it was great i had everyone there um they had a a lovely dinner set up for family and friends um where was it real sports bar and grill i think uh, it had it all rented out nice. for us for all the families to go and meet and then after that we went to harbor 60 um and and the night was lived on from there but no it was a great time i can't even remember who i called i probably didn't call anyone to be honest but my whole family was there so it was great got to share that whole moment with them Everyone warmed up pretty quick once we got in and, and the drinks were flowing, which was nice. And uh, yeah, it, no, it was a great time. I'll tell you what, that was a that was an unforgettable night. Uh, that's what I'll say to that. So Caroline and I both live in Edmonton, so I think it'd be uh, wrong of us not to mention those games in Edmonton. You guys are troopers. Obviously hey, I want to give you credit. You guys are troopers <laughs> for living in Edmonton. That winter was brick. That was one of the coldest yeah. things I've ever experienced in my entire life. Oh, Before you I been let in the Leah stands. go on, <laughs> honestly, so the first, so I used to live in Toronto and then I moved here yeah. and the first winter I experienced here, I I was like, what did, <laughs> what did where did I come? Why is it so cold? Why do I never want to leave my house for like a solid six month period? And then when you guys were playing Mexico, I was like, how the mm. hell are they going to do this? And more so, how is Mexico going to serve? Like the Mexican player is going to yeah. survive this. I mean, there was so many like guerrilla warfare tactics going on. Like, I know that I think we went to Sport Check and bought every single pair of gloves and like neck warmers and stuff 
just in case they needed some. Not that we needed any more, just so that they couldn't have them if they did need them. Like, I know there was some crazy things going on behind the scenes to make sure that we had every single advantage possible, but it really was. I'll tell you what, like, we came out of the field, and I remember I took my jacket off, and I was in the short sleeves, of course, have to. Um, and, and looking across, I think it was Chucky Lozano. I remember his face, he just went, oof, like, this guy's crazy. Like, this guy's actually a bit of a psychopath. And that's what you want, especially <laughs> as a defender. You want them, the striker to look at you like, ooh, I really don't want to be out here. And now you look across at your defender, and he's in short sleeves. You're like, oh, these dudes are crazy. Like, just get me back on the flight back to Mexico. And, and you know, that was what we wanted to do. That was, like, the whole purpose of playing outdoors on a pitch that, like, it didn't matter what – if you had daggers or knives on the bottom of your studs, like, you weren't getting into that turf. It was frozen. Like, you were better off wearing skates. Like, it was nuts. Um, there was just no thought of even trying to play a ball, that, like a cultured ball with any type of love on it, just because you couldn't feel your toes. You couldn't get your left foot, your plant foot when you're trying to hit a ball. Like you had no trust in it. It was one of the craziest games I've ever played in terms of that. Like it almost wasn't football, but it was so much fun because it was something so different. Um, and yeah, uh, I mean, that's one of the games I think is going to go down in Canadian kind of folklore of, of just the ice teca, just the whole experience. And you have to be there to really understand it. But so many people did show up. I mean, my parents, I have family all out in Vancouver, where I'm originally from. And they were all on planes flying out to Edmonton, you know, the day before and a couple of days before. And they said on the whole flight over, it's just people singing O Canada the whole time, chanting. And I was like, wow, we're really changing the culture here. And, and that was cool. And we felt that in the stadium. They definitely warmed it up a little bit for us. Um, but that was, that's the coldest game I've ever played in. And like, you're right. Edmonton winters are just different. And thank the Lord that was in November and not January. Like if that had been in January, I'm telling you, like there would have been dudes, even on our team, probably going like 20 minutes in like gaffer. Like I, I need something. <laughs> I, I need a hot, I need a hot tea in, in a hot tub. Like it was crazy. So no, that's, that's an iconic game. So happy I was a part of it. And uh yeah, hopefully that'll go down in, in Canadian soccer history. Yeah, I think just some of the pitches from that game, like when Lyron scored mm -hmm. and everyone's diving in the snow and everything like that, it, oh, yeah. it was crazy. Like, I, I grew up in England as a Baltimore Wanderers fan, and I would uh, up until the Oilers game seven, honestly, that was the You're best You're in game, Edmonton sport. from Bolton? Yeah. Oh, my days, Bolton, mate. Yeah. You, how are you surviving out here? Good for you. I hey, you know what? <laughs> The first winter oh, I came, it was apparently the coldest winter in Edmonton history. I remember specifically walking out of my door and my nose has just freezing. I was like 10 years old. I was like, what have my parents done to me here? Like, it didn't seem fair. But yeah, here I am. But that, that game was crazy. Like, what was it like actually? What was the atmosphere like on the pitch? Like, could you feel the crowd? Like you said, it made, made you feel a bit warmer, I suppose. But it was nice. That game would have been really difficult if we were still in the height of COVID and there was no fans there. I'm telling you, yeah. it would have been really tough to get up for that one. But having the whole crowd there and when we scored the first goal against Mexico, just hearing the roar, um, it was like I still, the hairs at the back of my neck kind of stand up. And it's just like it was such an amazing feeling. And I think that people were there. As soon as they got there, I think they realized that no matter what happens in this game, this is going to be a special moment that everyone will remember and will talk about. Like you could tell, I think that everyone mm -hmm. knew that it was in that building that they're going to be witnessing history. Like something special is going on here. Cause this is like, this was just like nothing like anyone had ever seen before or played in before. And I think that was a really cool moment for everyone. And, and, and people bought into that moment and you could tell they were extra loud. They were extra into it. Everyone was just enjoying being out there. Yeah, it was freezing, but people had 18 layers on hot chocolates in both hands and, and we're just doing it. Um, and that's one of the best things about Canadians is just like, that's what we're known for. You put your head down, you get out there, you, you suck it up and, and you enjoy the moment. And boy, did we ever do that. And, and thankfully we managed to get a result for them and, and really warm everyone's hearts and, and send everyone home happy. Cause it, it was a really cool, just a cool experience. And again, I think no matter what happens in my career, that'll go down as like a top three game that I've ever played in for sure. How long did it take for your toes to defrost? Because I swear that's the worst feeling as a footballer is like when you're, you you start to like curl your toes, and you're like, yeah. oh, I oh. can't feel them. And now I have to kick a ball. So <laughs> what was that like? Because that's some of my most like that. That's like trauma memories for me. And then two, how long did they take? Did it take for them to defrost? So first of all, 
I didn't tell my mom that I was going to go short sleeve in the game. And she'd been like texting me the couple <laughs> days before, like, you better wear a long sleeve. Like, maybe if you can't wear a jacket under your jersey. I said, whatever you want, mom, whatever you want. Like, sure. <laughs> um, so when I got out there and took my anthem jacket off and saw that, I knew that she was just cussing her mind, just, you know, just cussing <laughs> every single word under the sun. Um, but no, so for me, I have a really bad problem. Is my toes are extremely long. Like my family calls them tingers, toe fingers, because I can like probably pick up a tennis ball. So it's like, it's great for, you know, picking up tennis balls, but it's not great for pretty much anything else, especially when you live in Canada and, you know, that's not a lot of blood flow to your extremities. Um, so yeah, no, my toes were, were icicles. Um, so were my fingers. They're gone. I actually had um, frostbite and it, it lasted for about a month after the thing. And I, I didn't really have feeling in one of my top knuckles on my hands, which was like weird, but I just like, you know, it comes with it. It's one of the battle scars. Um, so that was a little creepy. And I was like, am I ever going to get this back? And what, whatever I Googled was kind of like, yeah, if it doesn't come back in like a week, you might never get it. I was like, okay, well, it's been like four. So I was a little worried about that, but it's here. It's back. We have full, uh, full range of motion, full feeling. Um, but yeah, no, you're right. Halftime was awful because you start to thaw out. And that was the worst thing as a kid training outdoors is like when you got back actually into the car and your mom said, you're like, you just, I would start, I'm like, ah, ah, ah. Cause like the blood starts rushing and it feels like they're going to like explode. So like my trip was always either sit on them. Like I learned as I got older, just put them in your mouth. As weird as that sounds, where's it looked, it was like a game changer. So you should have seen us. I mean, at halftime, <laughs> dudes are in there. Like I got like fingers in my mouth or the coach is talking to us. Like. Dudes are just fighting demons. Like, I think half the starting lineup was just like, you can just see everyone's like, just cussing. Like, fuck. Like, ah, I can't say that. Sorry. Uh, you can beat that one out. No, you're like, totally. Everyone's totally just cussing. Everyone, everyone's just cussing. Like, again, every word on the sun just because it's just like that pain. And the worst part was, is like, you know, as soon as you get through this pain, it normally takes about 15 minutes to get there. You're going back out onto the frozen pitch to do it all over again. You're going to have to thaw it again. So yeah, after the game, you know, we, we, we thawed out. It took a long time to leave that locker room because dudes were still feeling it. Like there was a hot tub in there. You're trying to like put your toe in there, but it's like stinging because it's just like the complete opposite. <laughs> yeah. it, was a, it was a whole process. And I'm telling you, like if there'd been a third game in that window, we would have been in trouble. Uh, thankfully, it was only a two game window because I think everyone just needed a, needed a, like a couple spa days after that just to get back mentally and physically to, to peak shape there. That, but yeah, what an experience. Tell you what, like, oh my goodness, what a, what a time. So I guess I, I have two quick questions on the game still. So you were involved yeah. in the first goal. You're the one that came in and fired the shot on goal. Like what was kind of going through your head? Like, okay, let's just get this on target and see what happens. You know, I, I stepped in ball kind of just bounced off my head it was a frozen ball and i saw it it propped up nice and you know honestly in a game like that when you're playing on a field that's like whether it's sand whether it's you know whatever kind of game you're playing but sometimes it's it's almost better to hit a volley because it's just you don't have to trust the ground mm -hmm. so i saw it, it was kind of bouncing and you know tejan was beside me it's like you know what, what i've been taught my entire time can like find a maverick all right where's fonzie where's tejan i'm like ah they're kind of beside me i thought you know what like that's the worst. So, you know, I take a shot. Oh, I, I put it into Rosette. Oh, sorry. You know, you just put your hand up. Sorry, Gaffer. Like, didn't mean to do it. But I realized, I'm like, you know, the ball's frozen. I'm cold. I can only imagine what a show was feeling like in net. Like, this guy has to wear goalie gloves. So I said, let's just put something on target and let's see what happens. And as soon as I shot it, I was like, ooh, that's got a chance. But then obviously the ball's frozen, so it doesn't fly nearly as far. It actually worked for me because it died. It dipped right in front of him. And as soon as it dipped, I said, oh, this is going to be a lot of trouble. Like, there's no way that he's going to be able to corral this. Like, I mean, yeah, he's got he's got two hockey gloves on pretty much. Like, there's no way he's going to, be able to catch this ball. Frozen hand just parried it. And at this point, I'm like, I think I've done my job pretty well here. You know, I did the whole hockey thing, get pucks on net. And now we need someone to crash the net, you know, crash the blue the blue crease here. And and sure enough, there was Kyle Laren, um, Johnny on the spot, tucked it away. And, and, you know, the rest is history. He scored another beautiful second goal. And. And, you know, I'm really happy that I was a part of that because that's probably one of my favorite moments, even though I don't think it counts an assist or a goal, obviously. But, you know, it, it's one of those ones that I'm like, I feel like I had a pretty big part in a pretty famous game and a pretty famous goal. So, you know, really happy with that. Well, when any, whenever anyone sees a highlight, they're always going to see that shot first. So uh, yeah, a quick, exactly. uh, another on. quick one on that one. Yeah, exactly. You're part of history, no matter what. Take that. Um, so the Mexico obviously scored pretty late to make it, an intense end into the game like 
what was that like? Time. Like I know that. Yeah, yeah. Like I, where I was sat was basically on the goal line where the ball was dragged off the line. Like you must have heart must have been in your mouth for a couple of minutes. I think and like okay, we gotta we gotta hold on to this and also get in the hot tub pretty quick here. <laughs> yeah. So the thing is, is when you play against a team that's you know considered the kings of Concacaf, is that they're not going to give up their throne easily, and we knew that. And as soon as they scored that one, I can't remember exactly what minute it was, but I looked at the clock and I said. Ooh, there is a lot more time that I would have liked. Because, you know, as a soccer player, often, like, you're kind of going through the game. And especially when you're up, you're like, don't look at the clock. Don't look at the clock. Like, if I wait a little longer, it'll be even later in the game. It'll be great. And, you know, you look <laughs> up at it, and you're like, oh, wow, it's the 90th minute. That's amazing. But, no, I remember looking up and going, ooh, that's – I would have liked it at least been, like, three or four minutes later. And they just threw the kitchen sink at us. I remember that one that you're talking about that got clear off the line. I ran with my guy. And the ball went over my head, and I just said, oh, please let someone be defending behind me. I turned around, and I just hugged my guy. Me and my guy, it's a great shot of me. I'm just hugging him, and we're both looking back on the line. And the ball somehow doesn't go in, and we're still hugging each other. The ball gets cleared. I'm like, oh, my goodness. But, yeah, you're absolutely, your heart's in your mouth. You're just like, please, guys, just get through this. Like, it's going to be the hardest two minutes of your life. But, man, you'll regret it for the rest of your life if you don't hold on to this. And, and again, with how the atmosphere was, the ice tech, everything going on, we had to win that game. There was no way we could possibly lose that. And I think deep down, we all knew that. We just said, look, we're going to leave it all out here. And also we knew that if we won that, we're going to be top of the table going into the, the Christmas break and the New Year's for of the octagonal. And uh, we managed to hold on to that as a massive result. And yeah, there was definitely a lot of squeaky bum time at the end, but hey, that's the sport, baby. You got to love it. I love that Liam brought up your shot because it was a cracker of a shot, but you played some midfield in your days. So you're not shy right. to take a nice Yeah. Don't be scared of me, Alistair. Be scared. Yeah, I'm upset. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is deep in the Wikipedia, isn't it? <laughs> uh, it's our job. So you you have that like versatility to your game, obviously, that we see as a right back, but you also have that experience as a midfielder. What's that been like for you to kind of evolve your game and, and change positions like that? Did you do that collegiately? Yes, I did, actually, out of necessity. Um, our right back going into my senior year got hurt. And, you know, the coach just kind of flirted with the idea. And I was like, uh, and I, I kind of had a feeling going into my senior year, I'm like, I'm the one that's going to get shafted out of the midfield three to get put out at right back. Um, and as soon as we got there for preseason, it was exactly that. Um, but then I realized, I'm like, man, this is fun. Like, our team has 60%, 65% of the ball. Like, I'm not really defending. I'm just overlapping, and I'm not getting marked. And also now, like, I can go and show my athleticism. I can run up and down and, and do a lot more than I was allowed to, really, as a six um, at Wake. So that was really exciting. I'll never forget, like, the first training we did it. We kind of played 11 v 11, and they put me and my my winger, who plays now with Minnesota United, uh, Justin McMaster, a Jamaican guy who's lightning quick, and, and, and me and him just absolutely tormented the left back. And anyone, anytime you looked over at the coaching staff on the side, they're just grinning ear to ear. They're like, oh, we have a very good thing going here. No one's going to know what's hit them. Um, and, you know, I, I could have taken it kind of as, you know, a bit of like, oh, really, I'm going to be the one moved to right back. Like, you couldn't have found someone else. Like, this is my year to start center mid. You know, obviously, Wake, we're, we're one of the top teams in, in the nation. But I saw it as like, look, this is a great chance for me to, to really prove myself that I can play different positions. And, and I think that... I think I deep down understood that my ceiling at right back was going to be higher. Of course, my floor was going to be lower than at center mid as a brand new position. And you're starting at a pretty high level. Um, but at the same time, I kind of relish that challenge of, you know what, if I do well at this, this could be a spot that, you know, takes me to the MLS. Because at that point, you know, I hadn't really been on a ton of scouting boards for, you know, whatever reason it is. But you know, I was kind of just looking forward to having a chance to potentially play pro. Um, and, you know, right back ended up being that that one. And I think I took a lot of the stuff that I learned from being a centerman my entire life mm -hmm. and brought it into playing right back or right wing back now with Montreal or right center back with Canada. Is, you know, you see the game from so many different lenses and angles that you understand what each player wants more, what you're playing with, and what each player doesn't want that you're playing against. And I think that's been one of the biggest things is that, I can really kind of go, oh, I know what that guy doesn't like because I played that position. I know what I didn't like when I was there. So I know what I need to do to force them into spots where they're going to be uncomfortable. So I think it's been a really good um, tool that I've had. Um, and, and I think for young players, it's really important to play different positions to see the game from it different ways and, and play in different formations, different systems, um, because there isn't one way that's necessarily the right way. Of course, you could say maybe Pep Guardiola's way, but... 
there's a champions league would would say otherwise um but you know like there's <laughs> so many ways different ways to play the game and it's so important for young players to learn different things because just because you're good at something it doesn't mean there might be a different spot or you know a different system where you could be even better and and that was kind of something that i looked at and, and i didn't see it as a punishment i saw it as an opportunity and, and it ended up paying off uh Quickly, collegiate, you know, soccer. Maybe for the listeners who are who are young and, and they want to eventually go to the U.S. and play, it's a grind. Yeah. It's it's a grind oh, yeah. athletically, academically. It's not easy. Probably <laughs> taught me some of my mo my biggest physical and emotional lessons in in the five years that I were there. Um, what was it like five. for you? Wow. I had Bravo. a red shirt. Bravo! Good for you. Shirt. Five years. I know, but. Everyone who said, even I know a lot of people that redshirt, they went, ooh, fifth year, that's going to be tough to get me to come back for another year. Like, they're just, you're so emotionally and physically spent, like, you're exhausted after it. It's such a grind. Exactly. Okay. So it's so funny. I've said this to someone before. I, when I finished that five years, I was like, Jesus, never, ever respectfully sign me up for this shit again. I said, if someone <laughs> gave me a suitcase with, with $1 billion cash, and they said, do yeah. it again, do it all again for five yeah. years, I would, I with on everything I decline. And that's mm -hmm. not a knock to collegiate soccer. You know, it, it, it forms the person you are. It forms the footballer you are. Like I got way better when I was playing there is really good competition and you're really forced yeah. to kind of go to another level, but it is, it's challenging. And that's something that I always feel is interesting. It's not sometimes always talked about, but what was your experience mm -hmm. like? And, and how did you balance, you know, the school and the soccer? Well, this is the thing is what I was taught very early is that there's three branches of college. You're going to have the education, you're going to have the athletics, and then you're going to have the social. Pick two, mm -hmm. kick, the third, kick the third to the curb because that's pretty much what's going to yeah. happen. And you really have to do that at the beginning because there's so many guys that get there. And, and from my experience is that, oof, you know, like college parties are fun. You know, like, oh, look at the frat life. Look at all these sororities. Like this is, this could be a lot of fun. And all of a sudden they're too focused on that, that they then forget about either the education is generally the one that gets next forgotten. It's the one that gets kicked to the curb. And before you know <laughs> it, they're struggling academically. Now you're not eligible. Your coach is going, what's going on? You're missing class, all this. So I think it was unbelievably good at making you become a very mature individual in terms of managing your time and prioritizing things. You have to prioritize. Like I knew for myself, I need my beauty sleep. Like I, I'll admit it. Like I'm a huge sleeper and I knew that if I didn't get like eight hours, I was going to be grumpy the next day and I wasn't going to be playing at my best. I wasn't going to be like a great student in class. I wasn't going to be nearly as talkative. Um, so that kind of changed things. And also you, you, there's different people that, yeah, there are going to be some people that can go up Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night, but those people aren't going to be the ones that are starting on athletic teams and potentially playing pro at the next level. So you have to understand that just because some students are doing that doesn't necessarily mean that you can do that. But there's times to have fun. I had a ton of fun. It was unbelievable. But I'm the same as you. If I had to go back right now to four more years of that, it's like, whoa. But if I didn't have the memories from what I have, like 100%, I'm signing up again. Because it's just like, it was such a rush. It was such a cool experience. You can't like change it for the world, but it really was exhausting. Like it, it's a crazy situation where every single hour of your day is like planned for you. And like, I remember I was taking like 17 minute naps. Like I get back to my room and be like, okay, <laughs> I quickly check my phone and be like, all right, I need to be out of here by, I want to get to this class. I need to leave 322 at the latest. Okay. I can do like 16 minutes and 30 second nap oh, oh, and set an alarm. Like what are my talking? Like, oh, what, what is this? This is like odd <laughs> behavior. When I look back on it, I'm like, this is like, serial killer kind of stuff so like you really realize like it's a completely different life but once you get through that you get to the real world like for example becoming a pro i got back i'm like i'm done training at what i'm off the field at 12 and i'm done for the day i'm like this seems too easy so like i'm already looking back like should i do more school is there something i should be doing because like it just feels like i have too much free time because once you get because in that bubble like even mm -hmm. just like calling your parents i'm like mom like i only got i can only talk for so long like it, it was crazy it's just so hectic it's so much fun. There's so much to do. Um, and I have to say though, I'm really happy I went to an American school because it just gave me such a different outlook on things. Um, I kind of knew what to expect if I'd gone to a Canadian school and I always wanted something a little different. I always wanted to kind of be unique, you know, the one that was, that did everything different. And uh, it was really fun. It, it was really special. I made some lifelong friendships from it. And 
I mean, yeah, Wake prepared me to go pro, and, and that was the most important thing. Um, got my education, got a degree from my mom. There you go. Um, I'll be using that at some point, I hope. And uh, no, everything went well. And, and, and so for all those young people that are thinking about doing it, I would really tell them to invest the, their time into learning about the school, making sure there's a program that you want to do, and get to know that coaching staff because you're going to be spending a lot of time with that coaching staff. And if you don't like them, if you don't have a good first impression from them or you've heard interesting things about them, I would, I would really make sure you do your due diligence because you're committing four years of your life. And those are four years where you're extremely like, I don't even know what the word is, but like moldable almost like you're at a very interesting stage of your life where things can really go one way or another. Um, and it's really important that you're around good people in a place where you feel comfortable um, and feel like you can grow. So I think it's a great opportunity, but at the same time, make sure you do your research and talk to people and make sure you find the right fit. I just have a couple more questions, Alex, Alistair. Jeez, I'm getting really bad at this right <laughs> now. <laughs> um, who do you think is one person on this Canadian team that people aren't talking about enough? Like, there's obviously a lot of players now who Caroline mentioned are in Champions League, but who's who's the one guy who you think people need to notice a little bit more? I personally think it's oh. you, to be honest, but who's another guy? Oh, I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> this is a great question. You know, I think before Tejon's move, it was Tejon for me. It's like, I remember going up against him in college and the MLS going like, what is this guy doing in this league? Like, get out of here. Like, come on, man. Like, there's no way someone should be dribbling at me right now, dropping a triple step over and gliding by me. Like, this is ridiculous. Like, come on. Um, so he's just an unbelievable talent. Um, I think Estacchio's really starting to get his his flowers, um, which is nice. Um, for me, I, I, I love Kamal Miller's game. I mean, I've known him for a long time. I, I think he's so just steady. Um, and the stuff he can do on the ball, it's like, really weird for a defender that's built as strong as he is to be that like he's got like dancing hips i really need to ask him if he did do like some ballet or something as a kid because like there's no way that a man like that should be that nimble like it, it's really crazy i think his game is is pretty cool um and, and just unique in its own right so like uh, but i do think yeah now since stage has got his move he's probably getting a lot more love but still for me he's just like one of those players like when he's on he's unplayable i mean i don't know if you guys saw it a couple days ago when they played atletico in the champions league like, he was just mm. tormenting dudes i'm like this is atletico madrid this is this is crazy like he'll be taking another step very shortly um if he's not a household name already just wait till after the world cup when he shows what he can do and, and makes that next move again to an even bigger league because that kid's got unbelievable talent. And again, just another just super humble and, and nice kid. So um, I, I'll go Tej on there, yeah. And then I just uh, have Alistair, one, you, one quick follow-up. Sorry, Caroline. <laughs> I was just going to say... No, no, go. go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, what are, you, what are your ambitions now for the rest of your career? Obviously, like, Montreal is doing really well right now. You're going to a World Cup, like... What's something else you want to try and accomplish? Do you maybe want to try and go test your talents in Europe one day too? I mean, here's the trap question. I was waiting for it. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, growing up in a British household, um, in a family that, you know, we watch Premier League every day, um, you know, it's it's definitely an aspiration for mine. I, I there's There's only so much I can say about it, but... Look, if an opportunity arises, for sure, I'm really happy right now at Montreal. I think we got a great thing going. Uh, but at the same time, I want to test myself and I want to see, you know, how high I can go. Uh, I think that's something that all athletes, deep down, it's just in our DNA that we want to be competitive. And, and coming with that competitive nature is you want to push yourself to play against the best and see how high you can push yourself. We never want to look back at our career and have the what if question. That's I think that's, you know, I, I probably have nightmares thinking about that, the what if um so you know i want to i want to push the boundaries of what's physically capable for me and you know if that means going overseas and, and trying to see what kind of level i can play at then then so be it but right now you know uh, i'm happy at montreal we'll see how the world cup goes we'll see what happens after that but uh no everything's going well so far alistair you said you're a united fan yes i am ma'am so what's what, what are your thoughts on the on the gong show happening over there right now um, I mean, the gong shows now have been going on for about a decade. Um, it's been a while. It's been, it's been very difficult. Um, you know, I was just watching the game actually right when I jumped onto the call, I, I was watching the end of our Europa League game. It, it feels weird seeing United in Europa League, um, and struggling against a team from Cyprus 
But, you know, I do trust Eric Ten Hag. I think he has, you know, the backbone and the identity that's required. It's just so difficult when you're at that level to – it's not always all about tactics. It's also so much about managing egos and personas mm-hmm. and stuff like that that people don't understand is that, you know, when a player makes $30 million a year for four years guaranteed, you know, they have a bit more say than someone who in the MLS is on the reserve minimum, you know, and, and that's natural. And so it's difficult to kind of manage all those egos. And, you know, for me, the biggest thing is, getting the right people in the locker room in terms of the right personalities. Obviously it's tough from the outside looking in. You don't know exactly what kind of characters they have. Um, but I think that that's something that he's going to be looking for is that not just really good footballers, but also people that he feels fit the United DNA. Um, and obviously I think there's some right now that probably, you know, have maybe potentially overstayed their welcome. Some would say, but it's also really difficult because, you know, you see what man city's doing right now. Um, Obviously, Liverpool was struggling a little bit this year, but what they've done over the past couple of years with Klopp. And and now you look at Arsenal. I mean, I, I really enjoy what Arsenal's doing. I think that Arsenal's a perfect example of what you need to do is you need to trust in a manager. If you believe in this guy, don't don't look at a small sample size. Continue to give him opportunities because there was already there was already options there where they could have gone, yeah, sack Arteta. You know, there was uh, – fans in England are, are hilarious like that. It's, they lose two games and say, get them out. And I'm like, mate, are you looking what I'm looking at? They have a team of full of 21, 22, 23-year-olds who are competing for the top six. And right now, if you just give Arteta time, he's literally making a mini-man city there. Like, they're a lovely team to watch. They play some unbelievable football. Um, and when you dominate a game like that in terms of, you know, through all the different aspects that they do, you're going to win the majority of their games. But of course there's going to be games you're going to lose. You know, there's going to be things that happen. It happens to Man City as well. There's a reason why they haven't won the Champions League. Um, so I think for me, it's just like, if this is the guy that they truly want to get behind an Eric Ten Hag, you got to fully back him. You got to give him the time. Um, and you got to understand there's going to be ups and downs. It's probably going to take, you know, three years, probably whatever, five or six transfer windows before you really start to see progress. But the problem is that United is such a big club. It's been in such turmoil now for the past decade. You know, they have the whole thing going off the owners, taking money out of the club, all of this. Old Trafford needs money put into it, the debt. There's just so many things going on for the fan base that it's like they're getting very impatient. It feels like it's just rebuild after rebuild. But for me, when I look at the managers that they've hired since Sir Alex left, this is the one that probably fits the DNA the most in terms of this is the best chance to really be a long-term stay and a long-term, you know, manager. I, for me, it's just, it always felt it's been like a stopgap manager. It's just been like, yeah, he can do a job, but at the end of the day, it's like, do you really see Jose Mourinho being at Man United for two decades? I don't. I, I, like, I never saw it. So, um, yeah, I, I'm really hopeful. I'm hoping Eric Ten Hag gets his chance, um, and I hope that he's the one. You know, I really do. Oh, my goodness, please. It's been a long enough. I feel for this season United fans, Liverpool. My dad's the biggest Liverpool Don't feel fan. for Liverpool fans. Don't feel for them. Well, don't feel for I them. say that. So, I'm I'm an AC Milan fan, so I hate Liverpool for the obvious Champions League final reason. But my dad, who's like my guy, okay. he's the biggest Liverpool fan. So he went last season to them yeah. almost like headlining about the quadruple. To this season, uh, I was telling Liam the other day on our show, they played the other day against, uh, was it Brighton that they played against? And yeah, I called oh him in the morning. Oh my goodness. Right? It was so bad. But I called that him That could have been morning. five nil within 10 minutes. Yeah. I know. I called him and I said, hey, dad, like, what's going on in the game? Because Liverpool's playing like shit. And he's like, I'm not watching. I'm grocery shopping. I'm like, you know. You know that if my dad's not watching and he chose to do groceries during a Liverpool game, it's only like, it's it's a downhill, like, a little bit of a downhill yeah. season for wow. Liverpool. So, Yeah. How you like? How do you think your Milan's looking? I saw them yesterday against Chelsea. It was okay. I mean, I'll take Leao off the hands if you uh, you guys uh, are willing to sell. United would gladly take him. I think Leao's good, and Portugal is going to be a sneaky team in the World Cup. I think. Um, I Dangerous. I agree. I'm very sad about AC Milan. Obviously, last season they did well. They won Serie A. Zlatan Ibrahimovic. When he, when it came out that he played six months with a torn ACL, I'm like, this guy's like. We think like He's I I have this theory. again. He's not human. So 
I was so happy and I was excited and I was saying to Liam on our show that I think a lot of the Italian teams, we were both saying that a lot of the Serie A teams would do well in the Champions League. And for me, it was a lock that we would beat Chelsea more than the other teams that we were playing. And yesterday was just, you know, it was, it made me sad. Like, that's the only answer I have is I saw that and I'm like, this is... You thought it was a lock that they were going to beat Chelsea yesterday at Stamford Bridge. Yes, because I think Chelsea is the most overhyped team in the Champions League. Um, and I also said this about wow. Tottenham. So, yeah, I'm not. And, okay. and I okay. also think I'm with you. I, I also think it's bullshit that they fired Tuchel the way they did. So we talk about teams like being done with their managers. Chelsea's right up there. I, that is one of the crazier takes. You thought AC Milan was a lock to beat Chelsea. That's a crazy one. I mean, yep. first of all, they need to learn how to mark Thiago Silva on corners because there was three in a row and he won the header every single time and they eventually scored. I said, I mean, surely someone else is seeing this and yelling at someone to, yeah, maybe maybe mark the guy who's winning every header. Um, so that was interesting. And I'm with you on the Tottenham. I think people were a little too high on them. They play a very, I mean, I love Victor Wanyama. He's my boy here at, uh, here at Montreal. Uh, he obviously played for Tottenham, but... I think they're a little, a little over, overvalued, in, in my opinion. They're a little one-dimensional. Uh, I just, I don't see how they're going to consistently beat the lower side teams. Where I really feel confident that Arsenal can go out and beat anyone outside the top six three 0 I just don't feel that with Tottenham. Um, so yeah, I, I'm with you on that. But that Milan one, wow, that is a, that's a hot take. That's a hot take. I just, I <laughs> maybe it's because, like, I mean, the way I am is I would never assume my team's going to lose. I feel like I'm like low key manifesting a win for them. So just yeah, based on enough. like their form, their form and everything and a lot of the young talent that they have, I was like Chelsea's going to not do well. They're not going to do well. They're not going to get yeah. out of the group and AC Milan's going to is going to win that game. I, I was really confident, but yeah, I was proven wrong. So what can you do? Um okay, before what we let you, you go, Alistair we, we appreciate your time so much. Before we let you go, who was one player that you grew up watching that you were like, this guy is my idol? Oof. You know, I was a center mid growing up, so it was probably between Paul Skulls and Zinedine Zidane. Not because I played anything like Zinedine Zidane, but just because whenever I watched him, I said, this guy is magical. And Paul Skulls, this guy could ping a ball wherever he wanted to on the field. And being a United supporter, he was my guy. Awesome. What did, would you would you think of Zidane's headbutt? Um, iconic. Uh, I hope I have a moment <laughs> yeah. as iconic as that at the World Cup. <laughs> yeah, maybe not for a headbutt, but hopefully I have an iconic moment like that at the World Cup. You know, maybe I'll maybe I'll have to shake it and polish it off for a good a good headbutt. But uh, no, he's he's such a special player, man. I mean, how he played the game, it was time slowed down for him. And there's not a lot of players in the history of the game where it's ever looked that easy, you know, and, and you got to appreciate that. And I think one of my biggest things is when I, when I look at those kind of players is that you got to look at what other top players of their generation said. And like, he's one of those guys. And I think Paul Scholes as well, but people say like, wow, one of the most difficult players to play against. And I think that when you get that kind of love, it's one thing to get it from the media. It's another thing when you get it from your peers, it just means that much more because these are the guys that go up against you and, and, and I think I, I, I'm exactly the same. It's like, I know exactly what wingers, like everyone rates in the league, for example, but I know which ones are most difficult for me. And like, I'm like, yeah, those are the guys that I would pick. And so, you know, when you hear that from your fellow peers, I, I think it means that much more. And it really goes to show how good they were. And I think Sedan and Skulls are two perfect examples of that, of guys who were like, obviously got a lot of love, but at the same time is like, maybe we're even still underappreciated. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Alistair, thank you so much for your time. We're, uh, we're big fans. We're rooting you guys on. We're going to be watching you in the World Cup. And we hope that you come back on one day. Maybe United turns it around and you can give us your in-depth analysis of, of the transition that they had. All right. So I'll see you guys in two decades then, or what's the plan? <laughs> yeah. I mean, Literally, see you never is what we're saying. Yeah, see you never. Is that what it sounded like? That was like the most unopen invite I've ever heard. Okay. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. This is fun. It's a good talk. <laughs> uh... <laughs>